Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Alad Vajdi. I'm your Health Center Institute Director. Thank you for joining me today. Childhood apraxia of speech was declared by ASHA in 2007 as a motor speech disorder. But up till then, it was addressed as a phonological disorder. Till today, 13 years later, people or professionals around the world are still treating it as phonological disorder and not all of systems are working um, uh, towards this uh, uh, phenomenon as, um, as a motor disorder and using motor speech tools. Although the motor declared guidelines by ASHA and by other professionals in other countries, professionals find it hard to diagnose it clearly due to the comorbidity with communication and language disorders. Only very small percentile of children with speech disorder referred to L Center in the last 20 years were diagnosed with apraxia of speech, although they were all suspected for it. This non-clarity might lead to non-accurate treatment since the essence of the syndrome is not addressed. An accurate treatment will integrate knowledge from several domains, such as communication, language, sensory, behavioral, emotional, cognitive, and the most important one for apraxia of speech, motor learning. The motor learning and motor control is usually being learned and practiced, researched through a sports academy or through dancing or this type of, of activities. However, uh, this type of knowledge and research doesn't belong only to these areas, but rather to any movement um, domain. One of the fascinating areas to use the motor learning and motor control is speech. Speech in its basic form is motor-based, before it's been used as a motor tool for language and communication. It is the most complicated motor task in the human body since for every syllable we activate directly and indirectly over 100 muscles. The timing of all the muscles in producing just one syllable is about 100 to 200 milliseconds. Full speech utterances, which include many sentences, require high motor control due to the high complexity of the motor system. Surprisingly, Children acquire speech spontaneously, without direct guidance. It happens because the peripheral and central nervous systems enable that. The children who cannot acquire speech spontaneously due to severe deficit in motor planning need to practice motor speech tasks repeatedly and accurately. The VML method which stands for verbal motor learning, is designed to treat this problem. It consists of a lot of um, uh, manual techniques that help the child to perform uh, and learn the new uh, motor speech movements and eventually enable speech. In addition, it uses 20 motor learning principles that helps the therapist to evaluate, to analyze, and eventually to treat um, within the session in a much more accurate uh, way which eventually uh, brings this treatment to high efficacy. Let's have a look at these motor learning principles and see how we use them in a speech treatment. Motor learning principles in the service of speech treatment. Let's have a look. So if you go into the uh, motor learning or motor control uh, textbooks and uh, big research area, uh, we can find a lot of uh, principles that you can extract out of this uh, research, out of these textbooks, that usually we use for, uh, for sports, for uh, music, from, for dancing, for all kind of uh, areas of, of when you practice a movement. Uh, but we can take the same idea, the same principles, uh, the same practice, and use it within uh, motor speech treatment, using it within apraxia of speech. Let's have a look at some of the principles. So the first one to talk about the stage of motor learning, we've got three stages, acquisition phase, um, 
um, retention phase and transfer phase. We can look at specificity and variability of practice. It's two principles that uh, teaches us about uh, a specific type of practice when practicing the same task over and over and again, or a variable practice when you take the same task and you practice it in, in a variable way. Contextual interference effect is, a, is a, a principle that deals with random and blocked practice. Discovery learning is a principle that deals with um, how free uh, the learner is to, to discover and, and to look for solutions uh, by himself or being taught, more taught and guided by, by the teacher. The mass versus distributed learning deals with uh, the difference between blocked, big blocks of practice with short intervals of rest um, in comparison to a distributed uh, type of learning when the blocks of practice are smaller and we've got bigger intervals uh, to rest in between, which is more beneficial um, and what would you use in which uh, condition or which situation. A man of practice is a big, um, a big principle, a very important principle that tells us how much we need to practice a specific task. It can be five repetitions, 10 repetitions, 20, 50, 100, maybe 500 repetitions. What's gonna be the best amount, the most efficient amount uh, to practice? And it's a very important question and the answer is not that simple. The modus scheme principle is a theory built by uh, Schmidt, Richard Schmidt back in the 70s and still holding today, uh, that tells us about um, a way of storing uh, modus schemes in the brain and using it um, while practicing. Um, the question is how does it deals or explains more dynamic theories of, uh, of motor learning and very important, we used a lot in the speech uh, treatment. A modeling principles tell us how we should model, how we should introduce the task to the learner, how the learner is learning the, in the acquisition phase, learning and the new parameters of the tasks and, um, and take it into the, uh, um, into the learning process. The feedback principle tells us about all types of feedback the teacher, the guide, the, um, uh, the therapist need to give to the, to the learner. It starts with knowledge of results, knowledge of performance, um, the time of, uh, of feedback, the intervals, uh, between, uh, between the types of feedback, the negative, a positive feedback, uh, the influence of feedback on motivation and so on. There's a lot of facets and a lot of elements within uh, this, uh, this area of, of giving feedback and it's affecting the whole learning process. Degrees of freedom is another aspect, another big principle that tells us um, about how many challenges does the uh, child need to face or the learner needs to face when practicing uh, a new task? How can you simplify the, the practice in order for the learner to be able to get uh, the, the set goals? Um, and what might be too many uh, uh, challenges or too many degrees of freedom in the way to acquire a specific task? The control parameter is another principle that defines the, uh, the parameters or the critical parameters of uh, the specific uh, task. And through controlling that and understanding the parameters of the task, we can control the learning, we can um, um, influence and the learning, the learning um, uh, finding the mistakes, defining the mistakes, and then um, uh, finding the right intervention or um, or the right techniques in order to correct these mistakes. Implicit versus explicit learning is a principle that talks about two ways of practicing. The explicit practice is, is a practice in which the learner is aware of the goals, is aware of the uh, parameters of the task, where, uh, whereas the uh, implicit learning is, is a practice where the learner is not aware of, uh, of the goal of, the, of this specific activity. And we use it a lot within the speech treatment because sometimes when you put the task in front of the child and the goal in front of the child, it's very stressful because it's very difficult. Sometimes you need to hide it and let the child focus on something else. Um, 
and then um, and then it's going to be easier for him to uh, to practice and to get that specific goal. So we use a lot of implicit learning within speech treatment. Uh, proximal and distal stabilization or dynamic stabilization. Um, it's another principle that we use um, when we need to uh, um, use. Uh, no. Proximal and distal dynamic stabilization is another principle that we use a lot within the speech treatment because almost every movement needs some proximal or distal stabilization for it to be accurate. So a lot of time um, we might let the child lay on his back uh, in order to create this proximal stabilization for the articulator to work with more accuracy and more control. Reaction time. So this principle deals with the amount of time it takes between the stimulation and the um, um, execution of the movement. We can divide it into six different uh, uh, stages and controlling the stages, understanding the stages um, help us as therapists to, to understand mistakes within uh, the performance, correct them uh, and be again more accurate in the way we execute uh, our practice. Precision and accuracy is important for us in order to understand and, and define all kind of phenomena within the speech, uh, within the speech process, because eventually we want the, um, the speech process, the speech practice to be precise, uh, to have accuracy within the results. Um, and when it's not accurate, when it's not precise, we can understand using these principles, um, understand the reason for it and correct it accordingly. Bottom up and top down um, principles. So two sides of the coin. The bottom up uh, defines uh, a practice when you start from the bottom, from the primary numbers of that specific task, if it's a complex task, and then you put things together in order to get eventually to the top. Uh, while top down treated the task from, from its whole presence. So you practice the whole task as a whole, uh, or the task as a whole, and eventually through that, you'll be able to learn about the more complexity uh, of the task. Um, when we practice speech with children with a practice of speech, usually we'll go through the bottom up, um, practicing top down as well, but usually um, building uh, the skill, uh, the top skill, which is the word, from its um, uh, primary numbers, from the, um, from the consonants, the vowels, the syllables, and then put it together into, into words. So we can use this both uh, directions in order to get eventually to our goal, producing sounds. The part practice versus whole practice. So part practice is, is, um, is a way uh, of practicing in which you take um, segments uh, or you, you practice segments of the, the big task, eventually you put it together in order to get uh, the big task. In, in a way, it's similar to bottom-up and top-down. It, it plays the same game. However, it's, it's a bit different. In part practice, we've got three types of, um, of practices, um, um, segmentation, simplification, and fractionization. We use them in, in speech all the time, uh, mostly when we uh, build words or multisyllabic combinations. On and off task, it's another principles come from the same direction, the same view, uh, like the part practice and the bottom up and top down. Um, in this type of practice, on task and off task, um, we, we practice things which are relevant or related or specifically related to the task and off task practicing um, elements which are not specifically the task, but uh, help or support the task. In every uh, sport, um, there's going to be, of course, on-task practice, but it's going to be an off-task practice as well in every sport. Um, and it's the same with speech. In speech, you'll find it with the NSOME, the non-speech oral motor exercises, which are the off-task practice, because they're not speech, but they contribute to, to the speech. And we can see high correlation between uh, the speech skills and um, NSOME uh, skill. Mental practice. 
and feel forward mechanism are also two important uh, principles that we use uh, within the uh, speech treatment. Um, now let's have a look at uh, in, uh, some principles in more uh, depth and more thoroughly. So let's start with the stage of motor learning. As we said before, we've got three stages, rehearsal, acquisition, uh, the retention and transfer. So the acquisition phase is the first stage. You get to know the task, the, the learner understands the, the, um, uh, the segments of the task. The retention is the ability to maintain the task performance after a period of time. It can be after a day or after a week. Um, the ability to, to produce the same performance under the same conditions. And the transfer phase is the ability to perform the task in different settings and the, under different conditions at the same level. So the transfer will take the task in, into different uh, um, uh, levels because you take the same, the same task and you produce it in different, in different ways. Let's take an example from sports. Um, for example, throwing a ball from the free throw line. So the acquisition phase, we practice, throw the ball, 10, 15, 20, 50, maybe 100 times. And let's say we get to accuracy of 40% uh, in scoring um, from the free throw line. A retention test will, be, will take place a week later, um, in which um, um, if, if the learner will be able to retain the same 40% under the same conditions, it means that you satisfy the retention uh, level. What would be a transfer level? Doing the same thing, keeping the same 40%, but under different conditions, maybe using the different balls, maybe different distance, maybe with someone guarding, uh, maybe under different lightning conditioning and so on. So this is how we can look at a task following the stages of motor learning. First of all, running the acquisition, getting to know the task, getting good control over the task, and to a different, to a specific level. Retention, be able to control the task under the same conditions, but after a period of time and transfer, taking the same level um, and running it or performing under different uh, conditions. The same thing happened with speech. Let's take, for example, a task imitating the word banana, which is a nice fruit, yellow, tasty. So first week, acquisition phase, practicing the word, using all kinds of uh, you know, various different techniques um, that uh, we've learned through the VML method. And, and let's say we got to a level of performing 60% uh, accuracy um, under imitation in the therapy room with the therapist. The retention um, test or retention phase would be um, the ability to produce the same word, banana, uh, and getting 60% uh, accuracy under the same uh, condition uh, imitation in the therapy room with the same therapist. So if, if the child was able to produce the word in the same level, same accuracy level, after a week, the next treatment means that he uh, satisfied the, the retention. So he's got strength. If he couldn't do it and he got, fell, back, fell back into 30%, um, 20%, or even less than that, it means that he's not at the retention phase, he's not strong enough, and it needs to get back into acquisition phase uh, until you'll be able to retain the same level. What would be a transfer phase? When you satisfy the retention, then a the transfer would be the ability to take this word banana and practice it or imitate it with maybe another person and maybe not in the therapy room, but outside or completing a word or even using um, and the word banana when asking for a banana or retrieving the word banana when you see a banana on, on the, in the card or on the computer and so on. So the transfer would, would be being able to take this skill of saying banana and use it under different uh, conditions. Now this is how we can uh, look uh, or, or use the stage of motor learning while practicing uh, speech. It gives us a very specific angle of um, of looking at this uh, acquisition um, or learning uh, process. Thank you for watching this video. See you soon.